let's look at the evolution of iPhone chip. It started off with A4. The speed was 1 gigahertz. It was based on 45 nanometer technology. Then A5 was introduced. Then it became A6, A7, and then it evolved into A14. The latest version is A14. You look at the difference. A4, the speed was 1 gigahertz, and A14, now the speed is 3.1 gigahertz. And the technology is 5 nanometer. A4 was based on 45 nanometer technology. What is technology? Technology is nothing but the size of the channel. If you consider CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor transistor, it has got source and drain and there is a channel in between source and drain. So in VLSI what we do is we always try to reduce the size of the channel. That's how we reduce the size of the transistor. When we can reduce the size of the transistor, we would be able to pack more number of transistors into the chip. That's where technology becomes very essential. So look at this evolution. It's a big proof for Moore's law. So the number of transistors in a chip doubles every two years. That's what Moore's law says. So you asked me a question. Uh, in reality, whether Moore's law is happening, are we able to maintain Moore's law, whether everything is happening in the semiconductor industry as per Moore's law? The proof is iPhone's evolution. So the journey started off with A4 and then it was going through various versions like A5, A6, A7 and today it has become A14. A14 as more than 11 billion transistors and it's based on 5 nanometer technology. So VLSI is a field which involves packing more and more transistors into a smaller and smaller chips. Billions of transistors per IC. A14 is the best example. It has 11.8 billion transistors. And A14 is the only chip fabricated on 5 nanometer technology. It's possible because there is a good progress in fabrication. So progress in fabrication of ICs has enabled us to create fast and powerful circuits. So before creating any complex chip, SOCs like A14, basically, we need to consult with the foundry, whether the foundry would be able to support that particular technology. That's what Apple did. So when TSMC was fine with fine nanometer technology, yes, the fabrication is possible for this particular fine nanometer technology. We can even realize a small transistor based on fine nanometer, then based on the approval, based on the consent from TSMC, Apple was able to fabricate the chip. What's really happening in the semiconductor industry? We always look at how to convert the existing complex systems into smaller and smaller chips like this. We have been discussing so much about SOC design how we can build SOCs like A14. That was pretty much related to design process. But when it comes to fabrication, how we can realize the chips? What could be the options? We can go with options like ASIC or FPGA. ASIC means application specific integrated circuit. FPGA means field programmable gate arrays. Let's look at FPGA. Field programmable gate arrays. It's a programmable chip available in the market. 
you can buy these chips directly from the vendors like Xilinx, now it's part of AMD, Altera, it's part of Intel or companies like Microchip. They provide ready-made chips. You can buy these chips and then you can configure the chips with your design. So basically you would be able to download any kind of design into the chip. You have designed a processor, then you can think of configuring the FPGA with processor, then the FPGA is going to be processor. You have designed an embedded systems microcontroller, then you can think of configuring the FPGA with microcontroller. It's reconfigurable. If there are any issues in the design process, later on you find some bugs, then you can erase the design, you can go back and fix the issue in the RTL, you can synthesize it, you can do place and route, and then you can generate the binary values. Once again, you can configure the chip. So, in this case, all these vendors, they provide software for the implementation. In case you are planning to use Xilinx FPGA, then you can think of using Xilinx software. It's called Integrated Software Environment. So this software can be used for everything. You can write RTL code and then you can run the simulation. You can synthesize your RTL code. You can do the implementation. That's slightly different from ASIC. It doesn't demand things like DFT. And finally, you would be able to generate binary. So that binary will be used to configure the FPGA. That's how it works. So you get the chip, the chip is going to be empty. It will have all the configurable logics. So if you consider FPGA, there could be two things mainly. One is actually programmable logic. It's called as LUT, lookup tables. And all these programmable logics will be connected through programmable interconnects. So the interconnects can also be programmed. You can program the logic as you like. You can program the interconnections as you like. That's how you would be able to realize any kind of logic. You think about uh, any combinational logic. You can define it as truth table. So you can think of storing the truth table in a memory. Then if you can map the memory input with the inputs and then memory output with the output, you would be able to realize any kind of combinational logic. That's nothing but LUT, lookup table. That's how FPGA operates. In addition to this, you may need some memory elements. So there could be a lot of flip-flops inside. You can make use of these memory elements. There could be different kinds of memories. And then how you want to make the connections, that's also programmable. In addition to this, FPGAs also provide hard macros. You, you may get processors as part of the FPGAs. Then you can think of adding some peripherals like interfaces. For example, you are thinking of creating a chip for home appliance. In this case, washing machine. The chip is going to be simple. You can use ARM core or RISC-V processor and you can also think of adding some interfaces like UART and some other IPs. It's not going to be complex like A14, it's going to be very simple. It could be even million gates. That's where you can think of using FPGA because FPGAs are not good for realizing complex chips like A14. If it is going to be like millions of gates it can be even little more complex also so we use fpgas to create products like routers switches printers also we use fpgas for the ai accelerators consumer electronics home appliances like washing machine or microwave oven. It's extensively used in the data center. And also we use FPGAs extensively for the ASIC prototyping. 
to verify A6. Now let's look at ASIC, application-specific integrated circuit. We prefer ASIC for two main reasons. If you want to customize area and power, in case of FPGA, think of it. It's a ready-made chip available in the market. You cannot customize the area. You cannot customize the power. It's like buying a ready-made shirt. But I want to create a chip something like this, a button size, and then I would like to have this chip on my blazer, and I want this chip to monitor my heartbeat, and this can communicate the values to my smartphone. So here I have a specific requirement. The size should be very small. At the same time, it should not demand a battery. So when it comes to creating this kind of chips, we prefer ASIC, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Chip makers like Intel, AMD, Infineon, Samsung, Qualcomm, they prefer ASICs to create their chips. They might also be into FPGAs, that could be different teams. If you look at the products, products like smartphones, tablets, laptops, they all use SOCs and SOCs can be built, complex SOCs I'm saying, can be built only through ASIC. So in this case, application specific integrated circuit, we need to work with an external foundry foundries like TSMC or global foundries. So everything is going to happen from the scratch. It will start from the specification, then the designer will write the RTL code, then the verification engineer will verify the RTL code, then it will go through synthesis and then implementation. As part of the implementation, we also insert test logic so there will be steps like floor planning, placement, routing. And then finally, there could be things like physical verification. And then finally, we will generate a routed netlist called GDS2. And this netlist will be sent to Foundry. And Foundry is the one that is going to fabricate the chip. So if there is any bug, you can't fix it later. So ASIC respins are highly expensive. You think of it. You have completed everything and then the netlist has been sent to the foundry and now you are getting the silicon but while running the software you find some major issues, major issues with the chip. Then you need to go all the way back to your specification you need to change certain things and then you need to rewrite the Verilog code or VHDL code and you have to redo everything and that's going to be time consuming that's going to be highly expensive so verification becomes very critical for the success of ASIC that's where we use ASIC prototyping which means we use FPGAs to create the prototype of the chip. You think of SOCs like A14, it's pretty complex, more than 11 billion transistors. So we need multiple FPGAs. So we use multiple FPGAs and then create a custom board and that's going to be equivalent to A14. And then we can think of running simulation on this board it's going to be much faster because simulation is always going to be slow. Everything happens in terms of software. So you can think of running simulation on this board. That's one way. Or you can also think of running the software, how the hardware software interaction is going to be. You can verify that. And that will reduce the risk, ASIC respins. So we use FPGAs extensively to verify ASICs. All right. 
Thanks for watching this video. Thank you.